We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. Tonight, we're featuring a question picked by our awesome tabletop bellhop patron, Patreon patrons. Become a Patreon patron at patreon.com slash tabletop bellhop, and you too could help influence future topics, as well as get other cool stuff like bonus audio, show notes, behind the scene blog posts, and access to, the, to our Discord. Now, our question tonight comes from Skeeter, who asked, any recommendations for cooperative games for uh, kids for family game nights? All right. Thanks so much for the question, Skeeter, and for our patrons, all of them, and the ones that helped us decide on this question tonight. Now, this is slightly ironic because we have someone who showed up in the lobby tonight that we haven't seen in quite some time because this question is very similar to one of the questions we first answered on the show back in July 2018. Uh, that was episode two or three. Back then, patron of the show Brian Kurtz was looking for less known kids cooperative kids games he was looking for uh hidden gems games that, that everyone hadn't heard of before and at this point this topic's almost three years old and a number of things have happened in that time for one my kids have gotten older so i'm playing different games with them second a whole bunch of new games have been released since then right we talked about it like six thousand to ten thousand games a year so i think what's going to happen is we're going to have some overlap, but we're going to have other things. Plus, Skeeter's actually looking for something different. Brian was looking for un, like lesser-known cooperative kids games, whereas Skeeter's specifically looking for family night games. So to me, that implies the parents will be playing too, and I'm going to be specifically looking for games that are not only fun for kids, but engaging enough to keep adults entertained as well. Well, Hasbro and many of the mass market companies have often tried to claim game night as their own, there are many good options out there in the hobby gaming market to better suit a family game night. So realize, first of all, there will be some overlap with the old list, though I think there's going to be plenty of new stuff here. Now, one thing I want to do before we get into the list, I'm going a bit off script here, is I did want to talk about why I think cooperative games are great for playing with kids for a couple reasons one of the main ones are some kids do not deal well with competition and by playing a cooperative game you're all in it together and you're working together and you either all lose or you all win so there's no conflict well there shouldn't be any conflict between the individual players second the second biggest thing to me that why I love cooperative games with kids is that coaching is allowed. It's part of the game. It's something that's encouraged. Uh, many of these games you're going to play with open hands or all the information on the table and the parents can coach the kids without ruining the experience, right? Like you don't want to coach your opponent or you don't want to be in teams and you're, you're helping the kids win and cheating basically, right? With a cooperative game, at least most of the ones we're going to mention tonight, there's no reason not to play with open cards or everything on the table so that the parents can work with the kids to beat the game together. And I don't know if you have other reasons you think would be, these would be good, but those were the two main things that hit me as why you should play cooperative games with your kids yeah, no, or other I, people's kids. I think just, just doubling down on that cooperative versus competitive. Uh, kids are going to be introduced to so much competition in their lives mm. through school and through sports and through other activities. Uh, why, why do you need to reinforce that at home when you could be just working together as a family and building those family bonds up? Very fair. So one of the things I didn't want to do tonight is break these games into specific age categories. And the reason for that is every kid is different. And you know the kids you're gaming with better than I do. Now, what I did do is I listed these in what I think of as the complexity and difficulty level. So the ones earlier on the list are generally going to be better for younger kids. And the ones later on the list are going to be better for older kids. Now, that's not going to be a hard and fast rule. Uh, if you happen to be the kid who or the parent with the six-year-old that can play power grid, all the power to you. Um, but this, I think, is going to apply to most things, Mo most, most average game groups. Nobody but you knows your kids, and those ages on the box are most often due to regulations, mm -hmm. not reality. Yeah, that's to be true. I did not actually look up what the age recommendations were on these games. This is all based on my personal experience with our kids, and, 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 and a couple of these actually based on some of my friends' experience with the kids. So I, to be honest, I don't know what age ages would be on these boxes, so we're, we're just going to wing it for there. <laughs> All right, the first game on the list tonight is Outfoxed. 
This is a cooperative deduction game for younger kids. Uh, in it, you are all playing fox detectives who are trying to figure out which one of the animals in the town stole a pie. Um, it uses a really cool plastic decoder to randomize who done it and to give you clues. So when you talk to an animal, you get to draw a card and put it on. And it'll give you an idea like, oh, the culprit wore a hat or the culprit didn't have glasses. And you use that while looking at all the various animals in the city and the cards to show them to try to deduce who it is. And then you get to the end and you flip it over and see if you were right. I got to admit, this one's not great for parents, right? I said I wanted to give a list that keeps the game engaging. I'll admit the first couple games are, are pretty good. Like you get into it, but then you start to see the patterns and like there's only so many options. And I got to admit, it's not overly engaging, but you know what? There aren't a lot of toddler games that are engaging for parents. But this one does a pretty decent job. This will be fun the first couple times. And then hopefully the kids kind of take it on their own or grow into bigger games. And that was Outfoxed. Up next, I have Robot Turtles. Uh, this STEM game was actually one of the very first big Kickstarter successes, big board game Kickstarter successes. This is a programmed movement game that will remind old timers like myself and Sean of Logo or Turtle Graphics. You set up some gems on a grid on a board, and then the players are challenged to program their robot turtles to collect them all. Now, I'll admit, when I got this, I was impressed by the quality, but I was disappointed by the number of scenarios that were given in the box. But you know what? That went away quickly because my kids loved making challenges for each other and for us. Because there's things like you can put walls out and the turtles can push each other and stuff like that. And, and they would make themselves puzzles and then they would make puzzles for us. And then we design challenges for them. Plus, if you're into robot turtles, there's forums online. And I don't know if there's like an official robot turtle website, but you can find all kinds of scenarios online, including additional rules with like new things to put out on the map people have come up with. This game has a following and there's quite a bit of support out there for it. All right, what? That was Robot Turtles. I got to ask before I go on, you know exactly what I meant by logo and turtle graphics, right? Oh, absolutely. Right? And, yeah, and I'm like, you're the right age group. Yep, in our chat room as well. Uh, that was, yeah. you know, from, from the, the PET and the Commodore 64 computers. Yeah, yeah that's where you had to program your robot. Like forward three, turn right, forward two. Pen the on, Robot don't Turtles pen is up actually... And pen down. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. Pen up, pen down. Robot Turtles was actually more impressive than that because it actually had, um, you could do procedural calls, function calls. Oh, so nice. you could have a function that was off to the side. So you could say like do loop and it would go do the loop. It, it was actually really well done. Nice. Again, that was Robot Turtles. I jumped back a bit. <laughs> up next, uh, something that I think if you have kids, you should pick up. And that is a set of Rory Story Cubes. These come in every possible conceivable set you can think of from actions to buildings to batman to spongebob to doctor who you can get a story cube set for almost anything if you have picked up one you're probably gonna want more i find that's a, that's a thing with horror story cubes um i started off with the basic set and then i got the action set and i got the places set and then i went on to i have uh a, there's a star wars set we don't actually have that one yet so what story cubes are is a set of d6 six-sided dice with images on the side and all you use them for is for inspiration to do improv based story gaming um the other people who might actually want a set of these is anyone getting into rpgs like these are great for i don't know what's in the town roll some story cubes now each set of story cubes is going to come with a wide number of games that can be played with them and i'm kind of stretching our definition of co-op game here a lot of them are cooperative but there are some competitive ones where everyone gets their own dice and they try to use their dice up first but there are a lot of cooperative games well, the boxes include a number of games, this is another one where if you go online and like Google games to play with Rory Story Cubes, you're going to get a ton of hits. People have done some really cool stuff with Story Cubes. And that was Rory's Story Cubes. Up next, I have Forbidden Island. Uh, to this day, I credit Forbidden Island as being one of the biggest inspirations for one of our girls learning to read. Now, that makes it sound like it's going to be a reading heavy game. It's not. This is literally all it has are location cards that say what the location is called, like Red Lighthouse or something like that. But my daughter, while playing this game, really wanted to be able to find the card so that I would draw the card and I would say Red Lighthouse and she'd be able to find the word Red Lighthouse. And then later to do the opposite where she could draw the card and tell us which one to find. So 
again, it's not a word game, but man, this game was great for that. Like just being able to play games was great to get her into reading more. Now, this is a great cooperative game, good for pretty much every age, because you can play this with open hands. Uh, as I was talking about earlier, things that are good about cooperative games, and you can easily coach the kids. Or once you've gotten better at the game, you can play with closed hands. Now, the goal is you're on an island. You need to recover four artifacts and get off the island before it sinks. And every round, it starts sinking more and more. Another nice touch in this game is that it features variable difficulty levels that you can scale up as the kids, and honestly, the parents, gain an experience. Now, once you've kind of mastered Forbidden Island, if you want a more involved game, um, which is better for older kids, also check out Forbidden Desert. That's the next one in the line. And that was Forbidden Island and, and or Forbidden Desert. Next up, the disappointingly named The Game, uh, probably the worst name in all board game history. The Game is a really solid cooperative card game with a really basic premise. You are trying to make two stacks of cards, one going up from numbers one to 100 and another going down from numbers one to 100. This is a great one for helping kids that struggle with counting and number recognition. And the neat part in this game is there's a little mechanic to give you an advantage where you can play a card that's exactly 10 away from one of the current face up cards to jump back, right? So to kind of dial back on a deck and give you a chance to play more cards. This is a could again be a perfect information game, but you don't want to show your hands. This is not one where you wanted to open the table that would make the game too easy. But you play your five, you play your six, you play your seven, but you are allowed to talk. Like, oh, I think I can put, you can't talk about the exact numbers you have. You're like, jump a little further, or don't go too far ahead, or just squeeze in a little more, or don't play too quick. You know, you can kind of throw that in there. And it's a really neat cooperative game with a really silly name. And that was the game. Similar to the game with a better name is The Mind. This is actually a follow-up to the game. And to be honest, I know it's the same publisher. I'm not sure if it's the same designer, but I think it might be. Um, this is one I like better. I prefer The Mind to the game. In this unique game, you're also trying to play your hand of cards and you're going from one to 99. So it's just one stack going one to 99. But in The Mind, you're not allowed to talk. Not only that, you're not allowed to communicate at all. If you play by the pure rules, there's allowed no communication. The first hand of the game, you have one card. If you have four players, someone's got to put the lowest, the second lowest, third lowest, and the last card down in numeric order. If you do that, you win. Then you go to round two, where everyone has two cards. Then you go to round three, where everyone has three cards. And then just keep stacking up. This one has proven to be I, I, almost ridiculously popular. The mind kind of exploded both with kids and with adults. This is a great party game, a great game to break out at a cafe or at a bar, and just as fun to play with your kids. Uh, and those are different uh, designers. So Okay, I thought it might be. I know it was the same publisher. Uh, and that was The Mind, also re-implemented by The Mind Extreme, where you're going up and down at the same uh, uh yeah, so, that one adds the two piles, which is yeah. part of why I thought it might be the same as the game. I have not tried that one, so I can't recommend that. One. Sounds like it might be better for older kids. Next, I have Castle Panic. Uh, I think everyone knows the term tower defense, and that's what this is based on, is the video game mechanic of tower defense, where you have a city or something you're trying to defend, and waves and waves of enemies are coming in. This has a fantasy theme, generic fantasy, where you are in a castle at the center of the board, and you have waves of monsters coming in. The monsters are drawn at random from a bag, so you never know if you're just going to have a couple weak goblins coming in, or be surrounded by a horde of ogres. Now, I'll admit it, I am not a huge fan of this game but many of my friends with kids swear by it. I'll, when I played this, I didn't have kids. Or if I had kids, I didn't play it with them. I can't remember which. It's an older game. I don't know if it's quite as old as my kids or not. Um, but it, I, I don't know. I found it a little too simple. Uh, but if kids love it, why not, right? It's, it's definitely more engaging than some kids' games that are out there. Now, once your kids do get older, what I would try, and this one I do own, is Star Trek Panic. This is a much more involved version of the same game that's significantly more detailed, but features this awesome looking cardboard star or enterprise and plastic shields that go around it and damage counters that go on it, which is also been changed to be mission paced. So you are trying to complete missions as well as defending from whatever's out in space around you. 
Now, the other thing I noticed actually while doing research for this show is there is now a My First Castle Panic, which seems like a great way to experience this Tower of Defense game with even younger kids. Now, again, I didn't even have kids when I played the first one. My First Castle Panic didn't exist when my kids were kids, so I can't recommend it from personal experience, but I know the game is popular with parents. And that was Castle Panic, which came out uh, around the time of your second so okay so i it might have been possible i could have picked it up but i definitely i played it at origins i remember that and that's about it mm. up next i have codenames duet now codenames duet is the cooperative version of codenames and as i like to point out every time we bring up this game the spite what the name says the name duet and what that implies and then what most people online seem to think this is not two player codenames it's cooperative code names, where the players split into two teams, which we found was perfect for family game nights, with either each parent pairing up with one kid, so they kind of have like a balance of experiences, or playing the kids versus us versus them, right? The kids versus us. Now, in code names, each player, each team gives a one word clue to the other team, trying to get them to guess face up words pertaining to that clue. If you manage to find all the words for each side before running out of clue tokens, you win as a team. But if you hit an assassin, you lose. And there's two assassins when playing duet, and each team can only see one of them. Really great version of codename. I actually prefer duet to playing regular codenames. Even if I have six adults, I would rather play a three-on-three -three game of duet than play codenames. And uh, codenames duet has uh, appeared online now. They have the official. Yes. They've got an official online version as well. And that was Codenames Duet. Next up, we have the newest game on this list, and that is the Dungeons & Dragons Adventure Begins board game. Uh, this was introduced by Hasbro in 2020, just last year, as a new introduction to the world of Dungeons & Dragons. While mechanically rather boring, this game shines by promoting players to tell stories as they play including descriptions of how they react to the situations presented in the game and how they manage to pull off their character's signature attacks. This is a great way to introduce your kids to structured storytelling and the world and like the monsters and the names and the, the, the whole experience that is Dungeons and Dragons. And that is Dungeons and Dragons Adventure Begins. Next, I have Flashpoint Fire Rescue. This is one, anytime we talk about co-op games, I'm going to bring up. This is a game where the players are playing firefighters trying to save people and pets from a burning building. Now, when playing with younger kids, you can play this at a fairly low age due to the open information and coaching. And it has a nice set of family rules that are rather simple, where you just randomly determine where the fires show up and you just have four basic actions. Add in the advanced rules as your kids get older and more experienced. Now, the full rules are more than enough for hobby gamers. Like, it's a solid, decent, cooperative game just for hobby gamers. And if that's not enough, you can get additional maps and expansions that add even more options and more complexity, including all kinds of like special equipment you can wear and like having the fire truck there and putting out a fire on a plane that's currently flying through the air. This is a great cooperative game overall, and for many years was actually my go-to cooperative game of choice. If someone said they wanted to play a cooperative game, this is what I would bring out. Yeah, the Flashpoint Fire Rescue is one that we comes up anytime we're talking about kids' games of any sort, really, yeah. uh, especially competitive. That is Flashpoint Co Fire Rescue. Cooperative. cooperative so competitive. Especially cooperative. Cooperative. All right, here, here is the game that does come up. Anytime we mention kids' games, uh, anytime anyone talks about kids' games, the first place I send them is to Ghost Fight and Treasure Hunters. What I want to add to this, though, is the Creepy Cellar expansion, because this was our number one recommendation the last time we had this topic three years ago. Ghost Fight and Treasure Hunters is still by far the best kids' game we played. It's great fun for kids, more than engaging enough for adults. I, I have broke this out with every age group out there. This is a game my kids will break out on their own, but also a game will break out when the kids aren't here or once they've gone to bed. Or often we play it once they go to bed, we keep playing. What's new, though, this time is the Creepy Cellar expansion, which we just reviewed last week. So I'm not going to get into full details of it, but this... Expansion is a great addition to Ghost Fight and Treasure Hunters. It not only adds some new content, but it actually rebalances the game, uh, giving players more options on their turn and a little more control. 
and just improving it overall, making it a more complete game. And that is Ghost Fight and Treasure Hunters with Creepy Cellar Expansion. Next on the list is probably going to be Sean's favorite as far as I'm concerned, and that is Harry Potter Hogwarts Battle, uh, which at the time was an honorable mention on our last list because I hadn't played it yet. But since then, we have gotten my kids into it. This is this is a game's perfect. Um, one of the things we talked about when engaging kids in a game is to uh, play a game that in, that about a license they like, right? Something they're already excited about. So this is a great game to introduce to kids if you have any Potterheads in your family. This is a gateway deck building game that progresses from like super gateway deck builder, like almost as basic as you can get in book one to a rather complicated deck building game by book seven, and then gets even more involved and complicated with the expansions. Now, what I like about this is that if you're playing with kids and you hit a book where they're not comfortable anymore, that it just got to be too much, you can just stop and keep playing by the earlier book's rules until they're comfortable enough to move on. Now, while adults may want to start with book three or four to dive into it for the full complexity, I once you have your family, just start at book one, work your way through, stop where the kids are comfortable and move on when they're ready. Yeah, the nice thing about uh, the family play is they really are books one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. So you can enjoy the story uh, playing out to some degree, mm -hmm. as well as the building complexity. Uh, or again, you know, if you are an experienced deck builder player and you, you're a bunch of adults one time, break out book four, you know, one through four all together at once, and you can get right into it with all the features available. Mm -hmm. And that was Harry Potter's Hogwarts Battle. Next up, I have Stuffed Fables. So again, going back to our list three years ago, I talked a lot about Mice and Mystics. Now I'll say Mice and Mystics is still a good game, but I no longer recommend that as a great game to pick up to play with your kids. Because since that time, the same designer and publisher has put out a better storybook game. And one that just is a better mechanically and better suited to kids, and that's Stuffed Fables. In this game, you play stuffies. These are stuffed animals. And the story starts with your girl, your human, spending her first night in a big girl bed, and you defending her from the monsters under the bed and getting sucked into their world. Stuff Fables just features simpler mechanics. It's the, the, I would call Mice and Mystics a dungeon crawler. This is more of a story game with different things going on that just use different colors of D6s. Um, and like health is trapped by your stuffing falling out. It's just easier to, more approachable, both mechanically and a more kid-friendly storyline. Because Mice and Mystics is actually pretty dark with assassinations and getting turned into a, a mouse where you may not want to. So Stuff Fables is now replaced Mice and Mystics for my go-to storybook game for kids. And that was Stuffed Fables. Uh, next up, now we're definitely getting into more hobby games, stuff that adults are going to enjoy even more and stuff for, better for older kids. And I'm going to start that off with Horrified Universal Monsters. Now, earlier I talked about the fact that Flashpoint used to be my go-to co-op game. Whenever I got together with people like, oh, I like cooperative games, that's what I break out. Well, that has shifted to this game. Now, you may think that horror movie game wouldn't be great for kids, but you know what? Horrified Universal Monsters is based on the, the older, campy, black and white Universal Monster movies. There also aren't any horror elements in the game. There's no blood. There's no, like, yes, you collect the gun. Yes, you collect the baseball bat, but you turn it in. Like, there's no real attacking in it. Uh, it it's, it's about as light as you can get for a horror game. One of the great things about Horrified, besides the fact it's just a fantastic game, read my full review if you want to see just why we love Horrified, is that you can adjust the difficulty based on the player's skill level. So if I was playing with kids, what I'd do is start with one monster. And if they crush the one monster, now try two monsters. And then if they crush that, move on to three monsters and so on. And if you can get your kids to be five monsters, you've done better than I have with a group of adults. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Horrified is just a fantastic game. And, and that, that variable difficulty is just so flexible for uh, any, any age group. And that is Horrified Universal Monsters. Next up, I have The Crew Quest for Planet Nine. This is a cooperative trick-taking game for up to five players. Players are going to work together to complete missions. These missions are going to require that each player win tricks containing specific cards sometimes in a specific order. 
Now, the core game here comes with 50 missions of increasing difficulty. And just like Hogwarts Battle, what I like about here is you would start at mission one, which is really simple. It's like one person has to take one card and that's it. And you have the whole deck in front of you. But you can keep playing. And then once it starts getting too hard for your kids, you can always go back and replay the easier missions. If there's a specific mission type you found a lot of fun, play it over and over again. The problem here is we're getting into higher complexity level. This is a game where you are not allowed to share information. So it's the exact opposite. This is not a game where you'll be able to coach the kids. So this is only going to work if your kids already understand basic trick taking. Like you're going to want to sit down and teach them to play Euchre, Spades, or Hearts first probably before diving into the crew. But this is a really cool one to get the family together around the table. Just playing a simple card game that doesn't take a lot of room. But it is definitely a, a tougher one. As as groups of adults, we have struggled. Yes. Uh, even within the first 20 missions at times. So that was The Crew, the quest for Planet Nine. All right, the last one on my list tonight is Wonder Woman, Challenge of the Amazons. My girls love the theme on this cooperative board game where the players take on the role of one of the DC Comics Amazons and work together to defend the island of Themyscira from enemies, including Ares, Circe, and the Cheetah. Uh, what I like about this game is it eliminates quarterbacking through program, uh, like a unique program movement system with some hidden information. Like the players have to program three moves a turn but only get two charts to choose from when they can plan and talk. But then when you're actually programming your moves, you have more cards, but you're not allowed to talk anymore. I love this because you don't have, it, it removes the coaching completely, which at this point, this is one that's definitely for kids with some significant board game experience. This isn't a gateway game. This is definitely not the first co-op game I throw at my kids, but if they have already enjoyed and you played every other game on the list till now, this might be a great next step without that quarterbacking, without that coaching, because you can't. This is good for kids who want to express their independence. They don't want you to help them anymore. They want to do their own thing. Well, they get to do that in this game. So that was Wonder Woman Challenge of the Amazons. Now, for those of you here live and listening to the podcast, you can learn more about Wonder Woman in our review segment later in the show. So we do have some honorable mentions I want to bring up uh, at the end of the show here. Um, these are games that we haven't personally played ourselves, but ones that have been recommended to us by friends or family, or games that I've seen on other top lists that look like they, they're on multiple top kids games lists, or games that I wish I owned that look like they'd be awesome for playing with kids. So the first one is mm, as in MMM exclamation mark, like mm, that's good. Uh, this was a 2016 Kinderspiel de Jar winner that right there, it's probably good. Like anything that wins the Kinderspiel is probably worth picking up as long as it's in the right age group. That's the problem is some of the Kinderspiel games, they're definitely on a scale. Sometimes they're definitely for younger kids and sometimes they're for older kids. This is definitely on the younger kid scale. This looks like it's one for, for younger generation. Um, I obviously didn't get to try this because in 2016, my kids were way too old for this one. So we never got to try it ourselves. Now this is a push your luck dice game where you're trying to roll food on your dice and sneak into the kitchen and grab a of all the food you can before getting caught by the family cat. So if you roll too many cats are out. Sounds really neat. Sounds really simple. Looks like a solid game. And that was, mm. Next up, I have Mole Rats in Space. This is a cooperative card game about mole rats trying to escape their doomed spaceship. Uh, this one came up as a recommendation for fans three years ago when we covered cooperative kids games, and I still think it belongs on the list. Now, again, by the time I learned about this game, it was a little too simple looking for my girls, so we haven't played it ourselves. But the recommendation still stands. And that was Mole Rats in Space. Up next, I have Hoot Owl Hoot. Uh, this one came from Brian, the fan who sent in the original question and is another game that my girls were just a little too old for at the time. Now, this one reminds me a bit of a cooperative version of Candyland because players are playing colored cards to move owls with the end goal of getting them all home to their nest. And that was Hoot Owl Hoot. 
on the couple games that I would love to get from my kids now that I think we'd have a great time with. And the first is Slide Quest. Uh, this is a newer cooperative game, just came out in 2019. It's a dexterity game that's based on the old wooden desktop game Labyrinth, where you're turning the dials to try to get a marble to go through a maze. Well, in Slide Quest, that marble is replaced by a knight with a little ball bearing in its base. And it's you're trying to navigate it around a maze like Slide and get it to fall into the right hole. The, interesting bit here is that every player is holding one an individual paddle thing like and you play like in the box this looks like a ton of fun i i would love to try this one with the kids plus i think it'd be a good um i i will adult beverage game as well and that was slide quest all right, the last game I have for tonight, this is another storybook game uh, from the same publisher as Mice and Mystics and Stuff Fables, though a different designer. It's not, uh, it's not Jeremy, Jeremy Hawthorne. Uh, this is Quirky Circuits. This is a cooperative program movement game, but not like, say, Robo Rally or Robot Turtles, because you are all programming the same cute-looking robot. Uh, one of the robots is actually a cat riding around on a Zumba. I thought it was a Roomba, sorry, whatever they're called. Roomba, Zumba is like the exercise thing my kids do. <laughs> on a Roomba, and there's all these cute things. You open up the storybook, and you are putting out cards. And the thing is, you don't know what the other people are programming. And that just sounds really fascinating, because I love program movement games like i'm a huge robot rally fan i'm a huge robot turtles fan i love um mice and not mice and mystics uh, uh what's the league of legend one i can't remember the league of legends game what it's called if it comes back to me i will mention it totally skipping my mind whatever i like program movement games and a cooperative program movement game is something i've never like okay sorry wonder woman's a cooperative program movement game but you're all programming your own it's it's the you are programming max versus minions there that's the League of Legends game. I got it before the chat. I feel good. Uh, but you're programming the same robot, and that sounds amazing. I, I I really want to try this one. Like this is a if we were going to game stores locally, I'd be like, please let me run a demo night of this game so I can try this game out. Because I think it's one that if you just saw it on the table, people are going to want this game. And that was Quirky Circuits. Well, that's it for our list of cooperative kids games for family game night. Let's head over to the lobby and see if anyone in our chat room has anything to add all right you fine folk in the chat room i've been seeing it scroll by i've been trying to ignore and not reply to uh some of the answers in there what are some cooperative games you like that you if you play with kids or if you haven't what are some of your favorite co-op games do you and i'll let you know if i think they'd be good for kids or not so the first two i saw mentioned uh red meeple ryan mentioned forbidden desert just before you got to it okay uh, but also uh, brought up forbidden sky which is the See? newer one and unfortunately doesn't look well rated no. no i i have not heard anything positive about that game to be honest um everyone i know says forbidden desert's way better than forbidden island the thing is, Forbidden Island is so accessible. That's why I kept it on the list as a kid's game. And if your kids love it and you enjoy it, move up to Forbidden Desert later. Right. Forbidden Sky is not performed well. It's, it's not rated well. Um, it's electronics, like you're hooking things up. So there's electricity involved, which you're playing you know, games with electricity with kids. You may want to avoid. It also seems very breakable because it's all plastic pieces you have to assemble. Mm. And it's rated bad. So to me, that's kind of three strikes, right? Like that, I, at least for kids. That's another one. If, if the local game store could get a copy in or something and I could sit down and play it, I would love to try it to see why it's rated so badly because the other games are really good. I'll admit Deanna doesn't like them much, but she doesn't like co-op games very much. And one of the things is I don't like playing those games with adults very much because they're terrible for quarterbacking. Right. Like they are very much a, no, no, you move there, you move there, then you do this, then do this. And then on my turn, I'm going to do the thing. And then when it comes back around to me, like that happens in Forbidden Desert and Island all the time. Right. then it's it's hard to cut back on because i'll do it because if i'm the person who knows the game best be like no 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 you don't want to go over there because if you go over there that's going to sink next so so that's but i still think for that playing with kids where you want that cooperation it's great but yeah i would skip forbidden sky unless you know better than i do somehow uh, Ryan, Ryan's mentioning he lost the game. Well, then he would not like the game extreme because yes. not only did they do a mind extreme, which gave you the t up and down, but they took the game extreme, which our game, which already had up and down and added other rules onto yes. the cards to make it even harder. 
yeah so when you play you do stuff but i think uh, instead ryan is making a reference to the uh the meme of i lost the game not i don't even know if he's ever actually played the game <laughs> uh, uh ryan's asking castle panic over dead panic well right there the theme right you're playing with kids <laughs> i i guess Zombie. if your kids are the older kids and they're zombies. really into zombies sure but the other thing is castle planet has way more expansion so if you do dig it there's a lot more you can expand it with i gotta admit the game does look neat with like when you got the catapults and the wizards and like uh, the undead coming in and stuff like see it way there it's weird i i'm I'm totally okay with castle theme with undead but zombies modern to me seems more horror because that's the other dead panic is is modern it's it's you're held up i don't know if it's at a gas station or whatever but it's a modern place a modern building right with waves of zombies coming in to me that doesn't seem like well i mean they're used to minecraft zombies which has that sort of uh fantasy feel to it right exactly to, to me i i personally think but again it depends on your kids uh, if your kids are into zombies as i mentioned with um with potter if you one of the biggest ways to hook a kid into playing a game is play a game of other thing they already love right yeah. like that's one of the best ways to get them to sit down and play so if they're really into the walking dead or zombies for whatever reason whether it's minecraft or the comic book they're currently reading then dead panic's probably the better choice right uh we have uh brian's interested in advice about ages for the D adventure begins i don't know if we want to cover that later or cover that now no we might as well cover it now since it was in the the list of recommendations i i hate giving age groups um the whole thing with that game is you could probably play with a six-year-old or a five-year-old because the actual mechanics of the game don't matter which we will get into later um the big thing in that game is open freeform storytelling it is i read a card that says you are standing at a lake and you see a glint out in the lake what do you do to find out what it is and then you just go and i could ask that question of a five-year-old and get a two-hour story out of them and it'd be great and probably an awesome story or i could ask and they go i swim out there and grab it right so at that level any almost any age could play The problem is then I'm going to have them roll a die and tell them what happened, which isn't based at all on the story they just told me, which again, we'll get into that problem with the game later, but it's the, can the five-year-old roll a D20 and tell me what the number means? And then more importantly is if they take damage, are they going to be able to move the tracker and track if they're dead or not, or the ability to use their items to get bonuses probably wouldn't be there. Like my kids at this point are 10 and 13, no problem whatsoever. Like, like not even a little bit. And the youngest does have some learning disabilities and still no problem whatsoever. Like the game worked great at 10 and 13. I think it would work with younger kids. Like I'm, I'm thinking eight is probably, but again, I hate throwing out a number. Right. Uh, Ryan's asking about your thoughts on aftermath. I unfortunately haven't played it. It looks fantastic. So this is the, the latest well, I don't know about the latest because Forbot- Forgotten Waters is newer. So one of the, the latest of the storybook games with miniatures, and it's basically you are taking stuff fables and putting it post-apocalyptic. I love the miniatures. I love the fact there's a cat finally because that's something they actually stayed away from in Mice and Mystics. But it seems to be, again, a more adult story. So might be a great follow-up to stuff fables as your kids get older. But again, the theme of Stuff Fables, the whole defend a, a girl going into her big girl bed, right? It's just like every kid gets that, right? Don't like I would think. I, I, I again, I haven't played it. It's, it's on my list of so far I've loved all those, but we haven't actually finished Stuff Fables. So despite the fact I'm telling you how much how great it is, it does require a time investment to play through multiple stories. And we just, my kids are totally obsessed right now with Minecraft and um, Animal Crossing and the Switch and Zelda Breath of the Wild, which they just call Link. <laughs> and getting them to play board games has actually gotten hard, which is disappointing for me. But I, it's at that point where they will play games now and then, but I, especially the youngest will play one round of something and then be like, can I go play something else? So uh, Ryan mentions Aftermath is nine, the board game. And I don't know if most familiar with that movie, but I'd say pretty close. Uh, And with uh, 700 ratings, it's coming in at a 7.9, which Which is, is is pretty solid. I mean, that's, that's, uh, that's a, that's a definitely something I'd be less hesitant to buy uh, seeing numbers like that on ratings. So. Uh, Brian's Anything commenting else? about uh, Candyland not being a game, and I I, I agree. <laughs> yep, yep. 
It is not. It is preset. It is a good teaching tool, as Sean points out. There, you got me to admit it. It's yeah. a good game to play with kids to teach them things like taking turns and winning and losing and how to be a good winner and how to be a good loser and things like that. Though I still think there are better options like Hoot Owl Hoot. And to be honest, I have not played Hoot Owl Hoot. It's just the movement system seems to be based on Candyland. Right. I am assuming that the deck isn't preset at the beginning of the game so that it's going to play out the same way every time, no matter what. Uh, and then we have uh, Ryan talking about Pandemic the Cure. You can have a plan, but the dice ultimately determine your action. So it yeah, lim- so that's removing the quarterbacking, quarterbacking issue. Now, I you will note there were no Pandemic games on the list. I would not uh, force any Pandemic-themed games on my kids probably now for the rest of their life. I would suggest probably not doing that for most parents for the next yeah. 10 years or so. Uh, a little too on the nose, I would think, right now. Plus, I actually have always been a bigger fan of games like uh, Flashpoint for that style. With action points to go around and clean stuff up on the board, I prefer Flashpoint or Horrified. Uh, and Mountain Pop is asking if Aftermath is the next step to Fables. Uh, officially, the, there are three, because it's Stuff Fables, then Comanauts, and then Aftermath. Yeah, but they're not... A, they're a, not a, yeah, they're not an actual progression. That's just the order the, the, the designer put them, them yeah. out. Aftermath, as far as I understand, is a continuation of the Mice and Mystics world more than the other, but I don't know. Right. Um, they're all they're all Jeremy Hawthorne, I think, is the designer. Yes. I hope I'm not getting Jer- that wrong. Jerry, Jerry Hawthorne. Jerry, say I was close. Jerry Hawthorne is the one that designed them all. Comanauts is is the game with the most weird theme that I have seen in a long time because it's you are a patient is unconscious in a hospital and dreaming in a coma you go into his mind and have to fix him and and, and i'm now, like wow haven't you played an, an rpg on that uh that's uh, sort of but not vaguely that. <laughs> vaguely similar there, to there are rpgs with a similar theme but not quite this not right. not fix the person in a coma so they wake up right uh, again that theme right there i'm not playing that with my kids right yeah yeah <laughs> yeah deanna's saying uh, Gizmos is not a cooperative game, Roger. Roger Gizmos is a great game for kids if you want to teach them about in, engine building. But yeah, it, fantastic it's definitely family, not family game, but not not the co-op. Yeah, these are all cooperative games. There are a number more. What I couldn't believe is how many cooperative games have now been published for little kids. Um, I, like from Habas for the First Orchard to like I was I, I, obviously I do research before these. I found a top fifty list of cooperative kids games. The fact there are 50, I was like, holy cow. Um, there was one about mermaids. Uh, again, this is, uh, the list is skewed a little towards older kids because, well, my kids have gotten older, so. Fair. Uh, Anything else from the chat? Are we good to go on? Well, I think we are there. Sounds good. So remember, if you have a game or game night question for us, all you got to do is head over to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop and fill out the form, or send me an email to questions at tabletopbellhop.com.